Some people believe that central bankers rule the world. And as for the United States, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913 as a central bank. And as we know, there's been a lot in the news in the last year about bank failures and is our money safe? A lot of people were wondering that question because the Treasury Department stepped in with the Federal Reserve and they bailed out banks and a lot of speculation on if banks collapse, more banks failed, would they do the same thing? Would they continue to insure depositors money in the bank for over $250,000? And a lot of people are asking the question, can you trust central banks? Can you trust the Federal Reserve? So I flew out to Portland, Oregon to talk to bank historian John Maxfield, who is John Maxfield on banks, somebody who's very knowledgeable on the history of banking, and I think you'll be surprised at the conversation that we had. John, thanks so much for having me to your home here in Oregon. I love it. I appreciate it. I love your work, man. I'm excited to dive deep and pick your brain about the current state of the banking industry and so much in the news right now and get your opinion on the Federal Reserve and kind of what's going on. But for those that don't know who you are, explain, you know, who's John Maxfield? So let me start out by saying that, and I told you this off camera, but like it means so much to me that you and your team flew out here with all that equipment and are sitting in my living room right now. It is so cool. That says so much about like what you value in life. And it's the same thing that I do as we were talking about, like relationships and understanding where a relationship can start and where it can end. So I just wanted to say like on camera that like, I appreciate very much that you guys are out here. Yes, sir. So who, who am I? Um, the way I like to describe myself is that I'm a clown, I'm like a janitor, you know what I mean? Because what I do is kind of like, it's kind of hard to explain, but, um, but the essence of it is that I study banking. I'm a very serious student of banking. And I've studied kind of all the different verticals, the history, the analytical part, the behavioral stuff. Um, and now I really focus my time on educating bank CEOs in the country. And so I host events. I do a little writing. Um, right now, as you know, I'm, I'm with this amazing videographer we're traveling the country, creating this amazing content that we're going to kind of play in the banking field and kind of introduce this new way of communicating. Um, so I guess the, the best way to sum it up is that um, I'm focused on studying banking and then sharing what I sharing what I learned. I know you went to law school, so you, that wasn't your path. But what, what's what's the fascination with the banking industry? So ever since I was a kid, I've studied subjects. I've gone subject matter by subject matter. And what I'll do is I'll I'll saturate the literature of the subject matter and learn everything I can about it. And then I'll reduce whatever that subject matter is to a simple underlying principle that is robust enough to cover everything that happens. And so I've done that with physics, I've done the religious topics, I've done it with high altitude mountaineering, I've done it with maritime disasters, all sorts of stuff. And so when the financial crisis hit, which you experienced that in the real estate world, which was, I can only imagine, um, what I realized was that I didn't understand why these things happen. And so I just wanted to understand why it happened. And so at the time I was working at a bookstore, I'd graduate, I did well in law school and all those things, but um, after that, I cashed in an investment, moved to Washington, D.C. My plan was just to, to, to read as many books as I could until my money ran out and then I'd get a real job. And um, the financial crisis hit and I said, well, here's the topic I'm going to study. And so I just started reading about banking and what I thought would take six months to a year to do the kind of go to the same kind of exercise I go through ended up taking 12 years. And um, uh, after 12 years, uh, I kind of realized that there's something I was clearly missing. There's something that was wrong in the literature, something, something was off. And um, so I've been the, spent the past two to three years trying to figure out what that was and, and then fixing that. Well, I know you said you've read about five or 600 books. I've seen your book collection. It's pretty massive. Now, let's talk about the banking industry because you know one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated to talk to you is because uh, there's a lot going on right now. And you know it's with what's happening with the Federal Reserve and how it relates to not just the economy in general, but what my business, right? The housing market. I've seen what appears to be so many lies, deception, false information, false reporting. And, you know, so that is really my passion of trying, you know, my audience, my clients, they, they rely on me to sort of flush it out, you know, get to the bottom, you know, try and figure out what's really going on, not what we're not hearing in this, um, uh, 
special agenda or special interest of mainstream media. So I want to talk about banking and 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 I have watched a couple of your podcasts and you know dating back to not that far off of the March 12th weekend. Um, I think it was March 10th when SVB collapsed, right? It was a Friday. They scurried in and, you know, um, rewrote FDIC policy essentially and bailed out this massive bank. And then several others failed as well. I mean, we had the over that weekend. Silicon Valley was the 10th, Signature was the 12th, First Republic, May 1st, um, Heartland, Tri State Bank. Uh, July 28th, Citizens Bank, November 3rd. And then recently, you know, we're seeing these New York banks and and stocks tumbling. And, you know, what I see is we're on the verge of a crisis. But what I want to sort of dive in is that on a couple of the interviews that I watched of you talking about, and it was shortly after the, the March fallout, the question was to you, are we over? Is this, you know, is the threat of banks going out, you know, is that, is it over? Have we seen the bottom of that? And you said yes. And I kind of want to know what's your opinion of banking right now? Because since then, another four banks have collapsed. So, you know, kind of fill us in. Has your, has your opinion changed on, you know, uh, the, the threat that we're facing? Because a lot of people don't trust their money in the bank. I mean, that's why we're seeing these bank runs. So, you know, if you can just kind of bring us up to speed on that and 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 what's your opinion of it now? Okay, I love this question. And, and I, I've not been asked this question and uh, I'm really glad you asked it. So let me say it like this. So um, I feel like I have a duty to the banking industry. I'm here to try to make a difference in this world, okay? I want to make a leverage difference. You know what I mean? I want to make as big of a difference as possible. And so where do you make a leverage difference? There's no better place in banking. Nothing's levered like banking, okay? And these things are built into the community. So if I want to make a difference, like if I can influence the banking industry, I can, I can, I can have a big difference in this world and helping people. The problem is that when you get to the point where I've gotten, and I don't want to toot my own horn, but like people listen to what I say about banks. Somebody like me cannot come out in the midst of crisis and say that things are getting worse or pick out a bank a lot of times I'll get asked questions. Is this bank okay? Is that bank okay? Is this bank okay? I, under no circumstances, whatever I think about that institution, I, under no circumstances, can I, can I say that I think that's going to bring a failure? Because it, 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 that is not to say that it would be a guarantee that that, that would be then a self-fulfilling prophecy. But there's a real, there's a real chance in, 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 a, in the midst of a crisis when they're going to, they're asking for somebody like my opinion, like mine, and they know it's credible, that that, that could be the end of that for the bank. And so you have to be really careful how you talk about this. And it's not because I'm trying to protect the banks. I'm not trying to protect the banks. I'm trying to protect us. Because like you have, you have 100 banks that go down. You, you, we're going to have ourselves a serious problem. So the answer to your question is, yeah, did I think that the crisis was over? No, I didn't think it was over at all. Okay? I didn't think it was over at all. And let me tell you why. If you go back through, there's nine major banking crises in the history of the United States of America. Okay? If you look at every single one of them, and I'll show you the imagery upstairs, I have it. There's a twin peaks on both of them, okay? And the, I'm talking, when I say, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the number of bank failures as a percentage of the number of banks. You have twin peaks, these two peaks in each crisis. And you say, well, why do you have those twin peaks? And what are those all about, right? And this will get to your point about kind of changing the FDIC policy. What you see is that that first failure is a market response to the over leverage and the overextension. Right, so that's the market saying, "Banks, you went too far. We're going to draw you back in." The market draws them back in. Then what happens when the market draws them in? The policymakers, because the the implication of when that happens with banks, you contract the money supply so much that then you put us you put us into a situation where it's like we could go into a serious economic type of depression, right? And so what you see is you see the policymakers will respond. And they'll pass legislation. The regulators will like enforce. They'll focus on something else to, to you know, in terms of the enforcement. Um, and typically, what happens is the response to that policy change causes a second peak in failures. So all along, I've actually anticipated like I wouldn't be surprised if there's a second peak because we've seen it every other time but one. Somebody like me, you you cannot say I can say it now because things are calmed down. Right? Things were a little crazy last week, but things have calmed down enough to where you know, one little additional bank expert saying something isn't going to trigger anything else. Do you know what I mean? But back at the time, we were not there. 
Well, you know, the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, sure. chairman, right? I mean, it's he testified to Congress that banking was strong, right? Sure. After the Silicon Valley Signature Bank, he testified maybe a week afterwards and said the banking industry is strong. Is what you're describing here the reason why? I mean, did they know that the banking industry is not strong? And the same apply that if they were to come out and say, I mean, just those mere words alone that, and, and I hear what you're saying, because banks' reputations will wipe them out. I mean, one leak out that something isn't right with a specific bank, and you're going to see bank runs just like we watched at Silicon Valley Bank, right? So is that why the Fed is testifying saying everything's strong the banking industry when they know it really isn't okay so let me two parts to that let me address the first one first just a side comment on this but to your point about just rumors and things being said about banks and what that can do there was a study in the 1920s there were about 600 bank failures a year because some there's deflation in the country because we could just come out of world war one and that deflation hits commodity prices well all these farmers had bought these farms at the high prices when we're in world war one and then that deflation caused all those farmers to go broke caused an average of 600 banks a year to fail through the 1920s which is funny because we think of the 20s as the roaring 20s and the 1930s as the depression but the reality is that outside of the large metropolitan areas in the 1920s there's basically a depression type of scenario across the entire country so, and there was a study done uh, in Florida because Florida had thousands of banks fail. And they went through all the bank failures and they say, well, why did they fail? And they kind of put it into a pie chart, the reasons they failed. 55% of the reasons were false rumors. That's how fragile banks are hmm. because the amount of leverage. So, so that's, that's that point. Now to the point about the Federal Reserve and Jay Powell, is Jay Powell coming out and saying things that he knows are untrue? Um, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know. I can't see into his head, although a good friend of mine was his chief of staff for, for a while. Um, but what I can tell you is this, that what he was likely referring to at the time was that we have a lot more capital in the system now than we had in 08, right? Because a lot of the argument with 08 was the problem. One of the problems is exacerbated because they didn't have no capital on their balance sheets. They were too levered. So we have a lot more capital on balance sheets. It's better capital. And the credit books of most of these banks are pretty good. The credit books of most of these banks are pretty good. And that's what he's referring to. What he left out, and for the same reason that I was telling you, because if Jay Powell comes out and says the banking system's a mess, that's not going to do anybody any good. That's not going to do anybody any good in this country or any other country. What he excluded from that was that the interest rate risk the banks are facing now is greater than any the interest rate risk they've ever faced before. And there are many banks that could potentially be on the precipice of failure as a result of that interest rate risk, but it's a different dynamic. But that that that's why I suspect he answered that question in that way. When you talk about capital, banks having more capital, where does that capital come from? Uh, well, that capital. So if you think about what a bank is, like a bank is just a big balance sheet, and on that balance sheet, you have uh, on your liabilities side, you have deposits, you have uh, borrowings from the wholesale market. Um, then you have your, your random liabilities. On the other side, on your asset side, you have your loans, your securities, your cash. But then the thing that, that evens it out between liabilities and your, 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 your assets is your, is your capital. And your typical bank, like I said, typical bank, let's say you're a $100 million bank in assets. That means you're going to have about $10 million in, in capital on your balance sheet. Where does that capital come from? Typically, when a bank is formed, it comes from you and I want to form a bank. You put a million in. I put 100,000 in, you know what I mean? Because you know, for obvious reasons, you're putting more in. That's the capital of that bank. But then once the bank is started, the capital, it generates its own capital. So you don't have to do a secondary offering, just the earnings. The typical bank will take, a, they break the earnings down a third, a third, a third. They'll take a third of it and distribute it to their shareholders via dividends or stock buybacks. They'll take a third of it and reinvest it in the business. And they'll take a third of it and use it to do mergers or acquisitions. Well, that third they're taking to reinvest in the business, that goes straight into your capital line. So you can get capital from two ways, investors putting it in to start a bank or to build it up on a secondary, or you can have capital that's just generated from the, from the institution itself. So you wouldn't consider the capital from depositors? Well, that's in, in, in banking parlance, that's not what you call it, but that is certainly capital. No question that's, about that, but that's not in the, in the, in the vernacular mm -hmm. that that's considered a liability. So Powell's not referring to the capital from deposits when he's talking about 
the banks being capitalized now more than the GFC. He's talking about what the banks, the owners of that bank are going to lose if that bank goes under. The owners of the bank, the I shareholders see. of the bank. I see. Yeah. I see. Which actually the reinvestment side could be from high profits that they've been making over the last 10 years or so. Not only can be, but typically is. Right. So when you look at that and you look at uh, the manipulation of the market by dropping the Fed rate to zero. Right. That helped the banks to become capitalized, obviously, maybe by design coming out of the GFC. And, and could one say that? Y yes. So, yes, but it also set the stage for what happened. Um, let me make one point on the Fed because there's a lot of controversies. So I'm neither for or against the Fed. You know what I mean? I like I, I I like I just try to understand how this stuff works. I think you are the same way. And um, so the reason we have the reason we're in this situation right now is because of the Federal Reserve. There, there's no question about that. Okay, and we're going to be living with this for probably 50 years. All right, the the consequences of this. Um, and but you have to in this situation you have to say okay why did it do what it did what did it do and what would happen if it didn't do that? And so you have to go back, you have to take your mind back in time to March, 2020. And March, 2020 hits, everything gets shut down. That's when Trump ever shut everything down, right? And then what happens? GDP falls on an annualized basis by 30%. Never in the history of the United States, even, in, uh, even including the Great Depression, has GDP fallen on an annualized basis by 30% in one quarter, not even close. When these guys are looking at that, these are these are people who know the history of financial markets. All they're thinking is Great Depression. And that's all I was thinking. I'm like, oh no, this is not good. And um, so what they did is they over, they threw everything they could at it and then even, th and then more and then even more. And they just made up other things and just like, they just threw everything at it. Just the hope of avoiding Great Depression, which we did. And we should all be thankful for that. So far. Which so far we, they, we have. We should be thankful for that, but that doesn't mean that there aren't consequences to the decisions that they made. And I guarantee you, they knew the consequences at the time. Well, let's talk about the Federal Reserve. Yeah. You know, you said you're neither for or against. Yeah. Maybe you would agree that they do manipulate the markets. Well, they control the markets. They control the markets. Yeah. Who owns the Federal Reserve? Well, that's, that's a good question, right? That's a good question, right? Ostensibly nobody, but uh, I would say that the the Titans of High Finance own it. That's what I would say. The banking uh, industry, uh, but the, own it in a way that like not actually you, you couldn't go and see a stock certificate. Right. You know what I mean? But the banking industry does the banking the banking industry certainly doesn't feel like it owns the the Fed. I'll tell you that if you go around and talk to bankers, they feel like they're owned by the Fed. But um, any regulator is subject to regula regulatory capture. But aren't they bankers? I mean, when you're looking at the 19 members, 12 of them represent the 12 districts in the United States, which are central banks. And then you have your seven board members, right? And some are bankers, some are not bankers. Right. But all like being on the Fed board. Rest assured of that. Right. But the 12 are. The t uh, the 12 oh, 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 I mean the 12 around the yeah, country. The districts, sure, right? The, the districts. 12. Then, yeah, right. they're typically bankers. So they're bankers. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the thing, like, because what we're getting at right now is not who owns the Fed. What we're getting right now is, are there people who are pulling strings to benefit their own cronies or whatever you want to call them at the expense of us who are not their cronies? And I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not, because people like us don't know the answer to that question, whether it's true or not. But but you're I, living in that world. I mean, you obviously you have to have some type of feeling or opinion. I mean, you're talking to these bank CEOs. I feel like most of these people are just trying to do their best every day, just like we are. Of the Federal Reserve. Just a, people in general. And I have found bankers to be, particularly as a general rule, particularly community oriented. Um, these are the people, if you go into any small town in this country and you go to the main, you go to the main street of that small town, what are you going to see there? You're going to see the, the, the only two story building in downtown and it's going to be a bank at that main intersection. And then you go around that town 
and you go to the United Way board, you go to the Habitat on, uh, for Humanity board, you go to all these different boards and you see who's sitting on these boards? Bankers. Bankers, bankers. They're on all these boards. Who's raising capital for these hospitals who need to, to build out a new addition? It's the bankers. Who is putting money in these universities and, and raising capital for these universities? It's the bankers. And so it's like, these are people who, and, and there's reasons for society's animosity towards bankers. And there's historical reasons for that that also play on religion and 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 and, and, and kind of the feelings towards like anti-Semitic feelings. We totally candid with you, um, but I have found these bank most of these bankers. Now I only deal with the best. Okay, I only deal with the best because I'm somebody who just likes to say nice things. So I don't want to deal with the worst because I don't want to say bad things. You know what I mean? So I only deal with the best. So my sample set is not a true sample set. Okay. But I found that in this sample set, and maybe this explains why they're the best, these are really, really good people. Well, you know, John, my, my feeling on the way people feel about the banking industry is they love the bankers when the bankers are approving what it is that they want to buy. But the minute that they can't afford to pay for something or that they feel like they're overextended, uh, but, you know, some of that is not, and I'm not blaming the bankers, but some of that is just the enticements that we have in life, keeping up with the Joneses, you know, making sure, I mean, we want, we want it. I mean, and the banks do give the opportunity to have it now and pay for it later. So, and, and I think a lot of the consumers are feeling that in the credit card debt that they have, right? The problem in banking isn't banking. The problem in banking is humans. We all are driven by certain things that we want. And the primary things that drive us are fear and greed. And the problem with banking in this regard is it is so vulnerable to greed. If you are greedy and you get in and control of a bank, the things you can do, you can't do anywhere else. And here's why. Your typical business faces what cons primary constraint? Scarcity. Your shoe store, scarcity demand, scarcity of supply, scarcity of labor, scarcity of real estate. That's your primary constraint. And you have to work around that constraint. What's the constraint in banking? It isn't scarcity. Matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. It's abundance. Abundance is the primary constraint in banking. And here's why. Your typical business, if it wants to grow, here's the best way to think about it. Your typical business is like on the planet Earth where you're facing gravity. To grow, to jump up off the ground, you're fighting gravity. All your effort is to jump off the ground if you're a shoe store, trying or car dealership, whatever it is. You're just trying to grow and sell stuff and increase your revenue. Banks are in the... And, and you run into an issue because it's like, let's say you own a Mercedes dealership and you decide that you're going to sell a Mercedes for $1 each. And you say, John, I'm going to sell Mercedes. How many Mercedes do you want? I would say, well, like, I probably want like five Mercedes. I'd get each of the different ones. I'd go to the fancy one. I'd get like a coupe. You know what I mean? But that'd probably be it because like, where am I going to park it? Park three on the street, maybe two in my garage. You know what I mean? Money is different. Money is different. Somebody comes to me and says, listen, John. I'm going to make you a loan for whatever a, that will always be a hundred basis points below the prevailing rate. How much money do you want? And it's non-recourse and it's an indefinite term. How much money do you want? The smart person says, I want infinity dollars. I want all the dollars. Why not? Right? I mean, like you don't have to store them anywhere. Just take them all for yourself. It has uh, the, 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 what's unique about banking is that the demand curve goes parabolic. It goes straight up at a certain point. No other industry is like that. And what that means is that the, the, the responsibility to control the growth at these institutions does not lie with the market. It lies with you, the guy running the bank or the woman running the bank. And why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because that guy or that woman gets a bonus at the end of the year based upon how much that bank has grown. And so if you can grow as fast as you want, what are you going to do? And you're driven by money and greed? You're going to grow that thing as fast as you want, irrespective of whether it's prudent growth or not. And that's the thing. And you and I were talking about this earlier. That's the thing that gets us into trouble on the front of these cycles. And the front of the cycles is the thing that gets us into trouble on the back of the cycles. And so it's like, it, but it's not, it's not a bank thing. It's a human thing. It's a human thing. And one other point on this. A lot of people look at like, like the leverage bank use and, and how the, our banks operate and the cycles that we go through and what that does to society and stuff like that. But what people fail to realize is that these are not bank decisions. These are society decisions. And in America, what do we value most? We want to be the best, right? We want to work harder than anybody else. 
right? We want to make more money. We want to grow faster than anybody else. Bankers are human Americans too. They feel the same way. And so these decisions in many respects are societal decisions. And then the bankers just operate within it as best they can or can't, depending on the bank. Yeah, it almost seems like a lack of oversight. You know, we 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 come in in certain industries, the real estate industry, the building industry, and we we overcompensate and whack these companies with government regulations. But yet, you know, Jay Powell just spoke to in an interview and said that the question was asked: Was there oversight in Silicon Valley Bank? And after a little bit of you know, yes, is what came out. Yes, there was oversight. So, you know, when we look at it, we go, okay, w- with what you just said. You know, these bankers, they get this abundance of, uh, we'll just call it equity or money. deposits, money, money, and they have to deploy that money, not necessarily in the in the smartest ways, but they, they don't want to sit on that money. They have, like you said, the boards that they have to count to. They have the shareholders in a lot of situations. So, um, and you also said that the greed on the, in the banking sector can be detrimental. In fact, if certain banks go down, it could bankrupt the government itself. I mean, we could just look at Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, right, as a as one of those big banks that certainly can't fail. But let's just talk for a minute about and there's bigger ones and there, that we don't know about it, it, because they, there's they have the assets that said there are banks with, I mean, twenty trillion in assets that they control. I mean, these are just huge. Yeah, I, I want to kind of go back to the Fed again because. You know, you said that um, the the banks don't feel that the the Fed is in their camp, if you will, but yet they're getting free money. I mean, essentially. So I don't know how they could say that right now. I mean, maybe because the free money is about to end or, or it's being threatened, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but let's just talk about the 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 board, the Fed board. So we have Powell at the the chairman, and we know that Obama elected him on the board and then Trump appointed him and then Trump appointed him as chairman, right? We know that. We also know that um, two other board members are from the Trump administration. And we know that four board members have been appointed by Biden. We have an election year coming up. So the question that so many people want to know is because we know that they control the markets. You just said that. We know what this election year, I mean, running for another term, the last thing, there are two things that you don't want, an economy that's fallen apart and high unemployment. They kind of are synonymous to themselves, right? But yet we sit there and we go, okay, well, the, the markets were planning on this last announcement on the 31st that Powell, they were hoping that Powell was going to drop the rates, kind of reprieve the, give the banks a little bit of reprieve because these high interest rates are destroying them, right? Now, Powell is saying maybe mid-year. I think if they, if they don't do it in March, they're not meeting again until May, right? Some people say, and I've interviewed people like Daniel DiMartino Bucci, was uh, an aide to the the uh, Fed Fisher, President Fisher of the Dallas Fed for nine years during the GFC. She says, well, the White House is probably pressuring Powell. Yep, that's probably true. And, you know, the banks are pressuring Powell. You've got Jamie that's Dimon. True. I mean, come on, that's man. True. It doesn't get much more powerful than that, at least in what we know, right? Yep. Um, the, the the pressures have to be saying, like, you need to you need to turn this around, right? Powell just announced in a 60-minute video, I don't know if you heard it, the interview, but mm-hmm. it just was released. The question was asked, how much political play comes into this effect? And he flat out said, none. Yeah. He said that integrity, something like this, forgive me if I botched this up, but he said integrity is the only thing you have. And that's all. He left it at that. Look, we're not playing the political. We are wanting to get price stability. But the question also said, why didn't you raise rates in 21? You know, what, what, what are you thinking? I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, look, inflation's running out of control. My industry, the housing market's gaining 20% plus a year, year over year. Why didn't, why didn't they do this in 21? They can't be, here's what he said. And then John, I, I want your opinion on this. It blew, blew me away. And I want to respect this guy. I mean, look, I'm, I know he's no dummy. He's a smart guy, right? Very smart. Pal, very, I mean, he was part of the Carlisle group, right? A partner in the Carlisle. I mean, this is a big, big business, right? Yeah. It's got some money. You're not a partner of the Carlisle group if you're a clown. Right. Yeah. So anyway, he said the reason they didn't do it 
was they were hoping that the markets would have worked their way out. If the Federal Reserve manipulates markets or controls markets, maybe manipulates isn't the right word, controls the market, he knows better than that at 0% interest rates. He knows at 2.74% mortgage for 30 I mean, the bond market mirrors the interest rate. Why don't you think they acted sooner? What was the benefit? What, who was benefiting and why? We didn't see inflation tick up until 22. That's why. Remember the whole, if, if you go back in time and remember the whole narrative about what was going on, remember lower for longer? Lower for longer, lower for longer, lower for longer. We had all that. We go down to 0% interest rates, and we're thinking lower for longer. And then if you chart out all these things, it's you can see very clearly what happened. You have COVID strikes, money floods in, liquidity floods in. Uh, then what happens? Then you have interest rates um, drop. Then you have inflation tick up finally over here. But inflation doesn't tick up until banks have gone out and changed the allocation of their balance sheet by buying a bunch of low yielding stuff, which caused the eventual crisis. But you can see along the way why the mistakes were made, because there's a period here after the money comes in in 2020 where inflation is 0%. We're actually thinking it's going to remember negative interest rates. Remember that whole sh yeah, that whole I do. thing? Yeah. 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 Because you borrow, you're a borrower. Like negative interest rates. The Federal Reserve believed that. Then we're at zero, so it's lower for longer. Then we finally get some inflation. And what do they say? Transitory. Transitory. Is it because they're lying or being dishonest? Look, I don't know these people, okay? But I tend to be one who defaults to thinking that people are trying to do the right thing as opposed to people are trying to do the wrong thing. So un unless I'm proven otherwise, I think that they are genuinely probably trying to do the right thing. But in the midst of this, and when you control such an important institution, mistakes are made. How can you say, though, that inflation wasn't until 22? I mean, we had at least 20% year-over-year gains from 20 to 21 in the housing market. And when we looked at automotive industry, yeah. we saw more inflation. You know, when we look at, you know, okay, so maybe some of that was uh, muddied by the supply chain issues that we have. I get that, right? We It was a perfect storm. I'm not saying, I, I'm not saying that anybody was deliberate and intent, right? Right, sure. But I'm saying from, re from a regulator standpoint, why is it that we're looking at such backward looking data and why is CPI sampling? I mean, do you think the CPI is a, is a accurate index of where we are with inflation? Of course not. And, 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 but, and so CPI is, it's, 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 a, it's a parent term that covers a whole bunch of different things. There's a bunch of different ways to measure CPI. And the reason, to your point, so you're, you're so dialed in on real estate. So like you would have been aware of what's going on there. So you have real estate and you have oil and gas and things like that. Well, a lot of those things are sucked out or pulled out of the CPI readings that the, that the Federal Reserve uses for the purpose of making these determinations. And there's, legitimate reasons for for all of these different things. Um, but it sets up a scenario where it's like, yeah, you can have inflation, but it's not, it's not showing on the scale that you're using to measure it. What about the debt? I mean, when you're looking, let's not, let's forget about inflation for a minute yep. and let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Yep. Or looking yep. at the wrong data or backward looking data or it's clouded by, you know, in, in, in supply chain issues. They did know that two things were happening. They knew that deposits in banks were being dried up, right? So when we look at even in 21, we had that spike in deposits when we had stimulus, right? People were home. They weren't spending like they usually do. They were refining, you know, getting home equity lines, putting money in the bank, at least for a temporary period of time until their contractors build them out on renovating their homes and doing things like that. But it was a big time of acquiring a lot of debt. We took a lot of debt on in 21, right? Rolling into 22. It, were they just not looking at that? Were they not looking at the bank's, you know, uh, deposits? I mean, the Fed charts show these deposits increasing and then being sucked out. 
And the debt, they sold debt hitting, I mean, we surpassed a trillion dollars in credit card debt. We were approaching that in 21. So why didn't they look at these metrics when they were figuring out, should we slow this lending down? And how would they do that? Raising the rate sooner would have dropped that lending down much quicker. It would have made those banks have to look at their borrowers in a different light. So how do you explain that? Let me let me answer that in a couple of different ways. So, because I want to touch on something that I think is really important and that I think is misunderstood, uh, but I think that you will find really interesting. And I think your audience will find really interesting. So let's talk about the, the national debt for a second. The national debt, and I don't know where we are at relative to GDP at this point, but you know it keeps inching up higher because we run deficits every single year. And there's this argument that people in kind of my world they look at and they think like that's a hyperbolic ar- argument that like one day China is going to turn the table on us and, gonna t- and th- that debt's going to be a problem for us, right? They think that's this is a hyperbolic uh, argument, but it's not a hyperbolic argument. Let me explain exactly how it's going to go down. Ch- China is the right thing to think about, okay? Because um, w- w- they hold so much of our debt, and because they're such a, they're a surplus country. And so, what is trying, China trying to do right now? China is trying to build an economic engine that is similar to ours. That is internally, that internally propels it. Our economy is not because of our trade. That's what China's is. It's an export-led economy still. But the strongest economies are ones that are internally grow. And that's what we have. It's everybody wants one of these. And so China is trying to get there. Okay. But in, all, along the path to getting there, you have to keep your currency from trading to, from floating on the public markets. And you have to keep your currency from floating on the public markets because the currency traders around the world can manipulate your currency price so much that it can actually impact your ex- imports and exports. And so China has kept it closed. So it doesn't matter who you are, you cannot go out and buy the Chinese currency, invest in it, right? And you have these foreign currency traders, you have these hedge funds, you have these enormous institutions, these enormous in- insurance companies that are sitting on all this capital. You have sovereign wealth funds that are all allocating their capital and they're trying to diversify it across all these different currencies. Right, and so what currencies do you have to diversify? We have the U.S. dollar. We have the deepest and strongest capital markets in the world by a long shot. Nobody's even close. You have Japan. Demographically, it's a disaster, and it's just a tiny little island. So they don't have like the the production capacity that we have. You have Europe. That's just a basket case. They never be able to like put that thing together totally right. We saw the U.K. get the, get out of it. You know what I mean? So you got the euro. Well, that's not, what's that going to do for you? Well, you're kind of you're basically left with the. The, the 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 yuan like the chinese currency it's like but you can't put any into that but as soon as they get that internal engine up and going they will open up to let their currency float because that's just how these things work in the development of a country okay they'll let it float and what happens when you let it float like it doesn't matter if you like the united states or you hate the united states if you're a trader that's sitting on billions of dollars in capital that needs to be allocated and allocated in a way that you're hedging your bets and you're protecting yourself from the downside you are going to allocate money into the Chinese currency. Every As soon as that opens up, money will al- be allocated into that. It doesn't matter. Like, let's say you allocate 10% of the world's funds into that. Well, that's 10% that you're sucking out of other currencies. And as soon as that starts sucking out of the you know, US dollar, those interest rates are going to go up to a point where is going to, by that point, we will have so much debt, just the debt service will be prohibitive for us to service that. And it is at that point that we face, the country faces, I don't want to overstate the case because I'm not a hyperbolic person, but we face a financially existential. We will, we will face a financially existential issue. We don't. We don't have any idea when that is. It's not anytime. It's not in the next five years or any because it, it'll take China a while to get this economy repositioned. And they're patient. They play the long game, but there will come a time when there is a reallocation decision. Once they open up that currency, that will be extremely detrimental to the, the finances of the United States government. Do you think that's one of the reasons why Jamie Dimon's financing so much of China's uh, businesses? The Jamie Dimon does what makes money. I heard an interview with Jamie, and um, the question was asked: You know, uh, what if the uh, United States, the president, you know, says no more business with China? What 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 do you think would would be the outcome now? I, th- I think uh, Jamie said something to the effect of, "Well, we'll have to have that conversation if it ever happens, or whatever." If the president tells me to stop dealing with China, but do you think that would ever be a you know? A, let's just say we you know end up in a some type of war, right? I mean, where there's all this talk with Taiwan and you know um, all these 
tabletop things that are going on right now that we hear about with, um, you know, China hacking us and doing these different things. I mean, do you think that it ever get to the point where, you know, they go to a Jamie Dimon and say, you need to get out of China? Uh, I don't know. That would be a geopolitical decision that'd be made, but I'll tell you this. Do you remember the inflation in 1881? Of course. Okay. So if, if we do that to China, that's going to make that inflation look like, like nothing. Yeah. It's going to be, yeah, I mean, that's going to make that inflation look like 20%. I mean, that's going to, it's like nothing. So the reason inflation has been so muted for the, for such a long time, despite all the stuff we've been going through since 1973, which was a start of a new era in the finance, the, the beginning of a new era, in the, the last era in the financial industry. The reason that we haven't seen the inflation is because like those manufacturing costs came down so far because we were, we were able to bring all that stuff over from China. So it offset the the energy stuff that caused things to go up. I think that was one of the reasons why our salaries haven't gone up too. <laughs> it's, that's exactly right. That's another conversation, right? That's I exactly mean, right. it wasn't until we became that global economy uh, when we started seeing, you know, uh, um, Americans really failing financially, and that gets back to the, you know, the sort of the the banking industry at hand because you know here and and I don't want to go too far down this this rabbit hole here, but you know, by banks offering up debt. And I think this is one of the problems that we have as a nation, right? I don't think anything, you know, affects us individually more than having debt and not being able to pay it back. But I think one of the problems that we've had with this inflation, especially lately, was that our salaries have been crushed and inflation has ran away to where most people can't save money. And what's happening is we're in this we're in this debt spiral where, you know, we're paying so much interest, not just from a government, but consumers are paying so much interest that they can never save any discretionary funds because all the discretionary funds are going to the banks in interest payments. I'll have to think about that. And credit card debt. Just think about the fact of financing almost 100% of your house. Sure. And think about- It's not your house. You're paying, it's the bank's house. So you're basically a tenant to the bank, but you're fixing it up and maintaining it so the bank doesn't lose its asset because it'll fall down around you if, you know, if so. But let's just kind of talk about banking now because why do so many banks fail, John? I mean, I've heard you say 17,000 banks about thereabouts have failed since the beginning of the banking industry. Why is this? So um, so let, let me give you the stats. So to your point, 17, so if you go back to the beginning of the country, when the first bank failures in this country were in 1809. If you go back to 1809, we've had 17,000 plus or minus bank failures, well, plus bank failures in the United States. Because there's large periods in the 1800s where the data is not reliable. So we know the, the failures we have counted were about 17,100 and some. Um, but the, we know there are hundreds more but let's just call it 17,000 just because that's where that's safe ground. There have been 22,000 mergers and acquisitions. So let's call it five, four to 5,000 of those are probably in lieu of failure. So a bank is going down, another bank swoops in and buys it for nothing, right? It, but it would have failed otherwise. So that alone, that puts your failure rate in banking. There's about 5,000 banks today, 4,600 or something like that, banks today. So that puts your failure rate at about four to five times your survival rate. But then when you factor in all the mergers and acquisitions, because if a bank gets acquired, right, or merged into another bank, it goes extinct. So if you think of, if you just look at the extinction rate in banking, your extinction rate's like, like eight times your survival rate. All right. And so the question is, to your point, why are there so many bank failures? Why is the level of attrition in banking so high? And it's it's a product of of, of two. Well, it's a product of a number of of the peculiarities in banking. One of them is the leverage. So like we talked about earlier, a typical bank is leveraged 10 to 1. So they hold $1 in equity for every $10 in liabilities that they have, or every $10 in assets, rather. And what that means is that if just the price of assets, like real estate or something, like that's typically what's on their balance sheet. If the price of real estate in this country falls 10%, your banks are basically wiped out. They're insolvent. But it doesn't even have to go that far. When Washington Mutual failed, it's the largest bank failure, and I'll show you the building when we're up in Seattle tomorrow. Um, when Washington Mutual failed, it was 300 and some plus billion uh, dollars in assets. Largest bank failure in the history of the United States. Failed one week after, it was, was seized one week after the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. Its non-performing loan ratio was 3.5%. What does that mean? That means that they got a 96.5% on their test. And they didn't get a B, they got an F. They failed. And so why, why is that? 
so you have the quantity of leverage, but the reason it's so vulnerable or so fragile is because it's not just the amount of leverage, it's the type of leverage that is used. We are talking about a home. We lever our homes. That's how we do it in the United States. We lever our homes. But how do we lever it? We get a 30-year mortgage to fix, you know, 30-year, you know, most of us, fixed rate mortgage, right? Uh, what does that mean? That means that the bank can't come for that money until you're done with the 30 years, as long as you're paying it along the way. That's not the case in banking. The the creditors of banks are depositors. A deposit is an immediately callable fund. So as soon as anything is heard that's bad, that money starts being sucked out. And so Washington Mutual, what you saw is as soon as people started getting worried about, I think they were doing, the, yeah, I think they were doing the pick a pays. As soon as it got out that a huge chunk of their portfolio was and, and their loan volume was pick a pays, you saw these three tran these three tranches of investors taking their money out. Maybe it's the Japanese. You, a group of foreign investors took a bunch of money out. A group of domestic investors, and I think another group of foreign investors. Um, and as soon as that money starts coming out, like that thing is going down. And so the 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 FDIC at that point will step in, even if it's still solvent. In fact, like most banks that fail are in fact solvent. It's one of the things that's misunderstood about banking. You have all these people, all this narrative around the financial crisis, like banks need more capital, banks need a bigger cushion to survive this stuff. The reality is that if you're levered 10 to one, I don't care if you're, it, it, nobody else should, should care if you have a 10% equity or 12% equity if you're a bank. That 2% isn't gonna do anything if you're making stupid made decisions in your loan portfolio because it's so much larger. And so like, I mean, the reason banks should fail is just because like these things are levered up. You know, well, let's just talk a minute about the real estate aspect of it because um, I personally believe we're in a real estate bubble. Do you feel that way? I feel multifamily is 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 there. What about single family? I think single family is going to. I, I don't like to make future predictions, uh, and you know so much more about this than I do. So I don't even want to make predictions because well, you know more you stuff than I do. Let so. me ask you something. Yeah, should a home trade at eight nine times? A median home at median income, eight to I mean, nine times. Yeah, I mean, if your median income in a in a market is a hundred thousand combined income, but yet let's just say the house median you home you, price, you shouldn't be more than three three x four. Okay. I mean, like well, right? that. So, would you agree that if it's even five times, would you agree that that could potentially not be sustainable? A hundred percent. The one thing you have to keep in mind, and you know this better than I do, so I don't even should, I shouldn't say it like that, Todd. But the interest rates have such a big impact on the value of a, a, of this type of asset because we use leverage for them. You so know what I mean? if the rates go up, then it would be fair to assume that the prices would have to adjust down. That's exactly right. So the question is That's this: exactly right. Why would the Fed drop interest rates when I think it's? Uh, Fair to argue that the real estate market is the largest market globally. Yeah, yeah. The U.S. real estate market is especially, the largest market especially. in the Especially, and, yeah, and the no question would be if it isn't globally. Yeah. And we know that because we walk right outside our door, we look to the left, we look to the right, we see buildings, we see houses. Everywhere we drive, it's real estate, right? It's yep. the land, it's where we live. You have to put people somewhere. Yep. When we watch real estate prices, so there's two things that happen. And I come from a building background, right? Many years, 1989, I started work serving the housing market. When you look at, there's two things. There's regulation that controls prices because you don't have a finite supply of real estate. It's controlled, right? Right. They they have moratoriums that control it. You know, the schools are overpopulated. We can't. You may have water restrictions, right? Um, you know, fire and life restrictions. You know, police department restrictions. I mean, you have to build infrastructure. You can't just go out and put thousand homes up somewhere you have to have the roads the infrastructure and things like that so there's regulations that kind of suppress the supply side and it's arguable whether we really have a supply issue or not but the other thing is the pricing of the real estate so you have supply and demand the building being suppressed right of some capacity and the price is going up with the demand because of cheap money free money 2.75 three percent 30 year fixed rate mortgages, right? If what you're saying is so that banks' vulnerabilities, 70%, arguably 70% of their balance sheet is in real estate, right? Yep, is that fair? Right. That's that's about right. That okay. sounds that sounds about right. Okay, so 70%. Now we know that if that falls down and people are underwater in their 
what they what it's worth and what they owe. I mean, we're about to see it commercial crisis. If if what you just said is if the interest rates stay high, I don't think we can assume that we're going to have 4% mortgages. No. Then then the market has to drop down to come in either that or employers need to miraculously pay come up with more money to pay their employees. And we know that hasn't happened in 40 years. Well, Todd, the one thing to keep in mind is that like that you're you're on a monthly basis if interest rates go down a, a, a family with a smaller income can afford much more house. Do you know what but I mean? But interest rates are not coming down. Right. But that's why, like, the, when they came down before, you saw that inflation. And so now the question well, what is, what's going to happen with that? And what's going to happen with those prices? Right. Yeah. And we so were talking about think? this. Well, we were talking about this earlier. And, like, what? So, what I'm going to re I'm going to say some of the things that you told me because you know this better than I do. I know banking well, okay, as well as anybody. But, your, I, uh, my theoretical opinion on banking is subservient in this in this situation to your on the ground knowledge of what you're actually seeing. Okay, and what I found was interesting and that I hadn't thought of was that, and I was talking to a real estate guy in Colorado just recently about how they're they're how they're doing that where you you prepay the points to artificially inflate the values. I didn't realize that there was such a large portion of these units that are sp ostensibly in the data set that in fact. The majority of the problem, if, if what you're telling me is true, the predominant share of these are not in the data set. And so we're looking at we're looking at a sample set that's not accurate. And so it's curious because you're now the second person that I, that I know and respect that know that's in the real estate business that that said the same thing, which leads you to believe that we actually don't have a very good sense of what's going on. People outside of real estate of what's going on in the real estate market, if what you're saying is true. John, people in the real estate market don't understand what's going on. I mean, it's, and look, and I'm not trying to say that I know everything that's going on, right? But I, I, I know the, the fundamentals, right? I know that if it, a lot of this reporting is not being reported to the multiple list service. And that's where a lot of the, the data is, is derived, right? So when we're looking at, you know, if we're looking at a community that has 140 homes available for build, and we only see a sampling of six of those on the multiple list. That's not a true sampling of the amount of lots that we have. And we can we can look at starts, construction starts, or we could try and look at um, we 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 could try and look at the permitting phase, right? But why would you build uh, permits expire, and then you have to re get uh, re up those permits? So builders don't typically get a permit on a property until it's under contract. So what we're looking at is, or what we really need to consider when we're talking about the availability of homes is we have to talk about the approved subdivisions that, you know, that in some cases take years to get approved, right? This is not something you walk down and say, look, I have a thousand acres or 1500 acres. I want to break this up into a subdivision. How many homes can I put in? What's my infrastructure? What do I need to po post in bonds before I get my grading permits, my stormwater management? We need to take an assessment of all these available lots and look at these builders now that have been adding uh, seller, you know, basically contributions, concessions for buyers that aren't even being revealed. They're not even being talked about. What does it cost to lock in a five and a half in this real you know, interest rate environment? We're seeing builders are spending, in some cases, fifty thousand dollars for a thirty-year lock, you know, buy down. So, you know, it, it, but what concerns me is what you just said is when we're talking about banks in if these rates, and that's what happened in the GFC, right? You were in this business back then. There were people that gave the keys back to their bank and lived there for ten years without paying a mortgage payment because as the banks were imploding, they couldn't find the original notes. Right. They had to have the original note. A lot of them had second mortgages. They had to get the second forgiven before the first could foreclose. A lot of these people lived in their houses for a decade. And a lot of people stopped paying because the house next door could be bought for $100,000 less than what they owed. Right. So what happens? Let's let's play this out. Not saying that it's going to happen. What does the Fed do then? What do the banks do then? If we do or just see a sampling of what we hear in commercial real estate, if they really is true that we have a real estate, commercial real estate crisis on our hands, what happens next? Uh, well, if we really have a real, if we, if, if so, hypothetically speaking, if we do really have a commercial real estate crisis that comes to fruition, what is going to happen? You're going to have a load of bank failures, excuse the language, because it makes up 
a majority of the balance sheet, unless the regulators come in and offer forbearance, which we've seen that over and over again through time. And we want that because we don't, in the 1980s, every single major money center bank in this country was underwater. Every single one of them. Okay. Now the regulators ostensibly should have done what? Gone in and seized those things and then given them to someone else. But they didn't. Why? Because you feel all your money center banks, your, your, your economy is going in. I mean, it's like, you're, it's over. It's over. And it's going to be over for a long time. It's, it's not going to be a pretty scenario. So, but l- let me bring up, let me bring up a, a, another point. And that is that like, all the stuff that we're talking about right now really revolves around the question of cycles. We have these cycles. The Federal Reserve exacerbates the cycles, triggers the cycles, whatever verb you want to use. And the question is, is, when you have a cycle, you have an up cycle and a down cycle. And everybody likes to focus on the down cycle and say like, cycles are bad. And why are we making these things worse? The more interesting question is, are cycles bad? Is that bad? Is it bad? And here's what I would tell you. In 1873, here's a story from over 100 years ago, Todd. 1873, we're coming out of the Civil War. The Union did not think they were going to be able to finance that thing, that war. They cannot sell those bonds to pay the army. And so they say, we're going to go to this guy named Jay Cook. He's a banker in Philadelphia, like a total whiz, like a true prodigy and like a marketing prodigy and a finance prodigy. And he figures out, he's the first person in the United States who figures out how to distribute, have a build, build out a retail distribution of government bonds. He built up this retail distribution of government bonds. He finances that war basically for the Union Army. We then come out of that war and what's going on in the country at the time? Well, we had just finished the Transcontinental Railroad it, that connected uh, in 1869, and there's a railroad boom. But there's another thing going on. The British up in Canada are trying to come down on the western side into like Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, Washington. And the government's like, well, you know, uh, how are we going to stop this? And how do you stop that? Well, geopolitically, the way you stop that is you populate the region with your own people. And they'll keep them out. Your, your people will then keep them out. And how do you populate a region in the United States? Back in the day, you build a railroad. So what are they going to do? They build the Northern Pacific Railroad. Problem with the Northern Pacific Railroad is that there were already two transcontinental railroads. There was the transcontinental railroad, the Union Pacific that went through right to the middle of the country. And then there's the Southern Pacific that went to kind of like down like Santa Fe and all those areas in Texas and stuff like that. And uh, so it's not the ec- most economical railroad, but we need that railroad built to shore up that line. So we get America and they get Canada. You know what I mean? So they go to Jay Cook and they say, Jay Cook, like you, we can't get this railroad finance. Can you do it? And he's like, mm, sure. At the behest of the government. I'll, sure, I'll do that. So he goes, he takes all those bonds onto his balance sheet and they're building that railroad out and you get caught in a seam in the markets when the markets go down. And when those markets go down, the most speculative assets go down the furthest, right? The most speculative assets at the time were railroad bonds. So that he gets crushed. That that triggers a panic that then turns into what is called, this panic of 1873, and then turns into what's called the long, the, pre, the long Depression. And it's basically like the Great Depression, but even worse, okay? There was one of those in the 1870s. There was one of those in the 1830s and early, early 1840s. And there was one of those in the 1890s. These things were bad news bears, Okay. So Jay Cook goes down and there's all this pandemonium. And so then you look in, the, in hindsight, you think, God, the country went through this long depression and all this stuff. And you think like, well, is it even worth it? And what I would say is like, well, you tell me what Washington, Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, and South Dakota are worth. A lot. Okay. And so, yeah, we go through these cycles and all these crazy things happen. But like we advance so much more on the upswing than we give, give back on the downswing. And so like, to me, yeah, panics aren't good. They're not pleasant when you're in the middle of it, particularly if you're the one that gets caught in the middle of it. And I haven't been, and I certainly could have been, and this could, could, could certainly could be in the future, and this could change my opinion. But I, I've come to the belief that like the, the cycles are worth it if you care about growth and you care about power. And any American who doesn't care about growth and doesn't care about geopolitical power is an American doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, I mean, we'd have to forgive consumer debt for it to be a good thing at this point. I mean, good that's growth, it, right, though, right. But good growth, yeah, yeah. to your point, good right. growth, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about, as we kind of land the plane here, um, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, potential rate cuts, uh, the Fed, you know, cutting the interest rate. Powell said that they have to be careful. That they can't make it too long with higher for longer in the rates because that would have a negative impact. But yet cutting them too soon could have a negative impact. 
Uh, but the biggest thing in the news right now that I'm kind of curious to find out your thoughts on is this bank funding program that they generated because of the March 12th weekend. It was, I read somewhere where um, they said that banks are taking advantage of the free money. And uh, which, you know, it, it's, it's crazy because you, you're going to penalize now the ones that may need it because of the ones that are taking advantage of the system. One, do you think they'll really end that program? And if they do, what will be the consequences? Um, so I, of course, don't know the answer to the question of whether they will end it because I don't, they don't let me into that room to be a decision maker. Um, but yes, I, all of these things have a sunset. All, you, you see all these temporary facilities that they set up in all the different crises and all these facilities, you have the RFC, right, from back in the day. I mean, they have all these facilities, and they all end, it's, they all sunset at a certain point. And so this, I would, I'd be surprised if this were the first indefinitely lasting, you know, the type of response that, that we've ever seen. So yeah, I, I'd be surprised about that. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the Federal Reserve knew that when they did that with the interest rates, the banks would fail. They knew that. And so we're at the end of this. I, I see that. But let me let me ex kind of explain the thought process here of why the Federal Reserve would do something knowing that you're going to have it's going to trigger failures and potentially some major failures in a situation where so the economy is basically it consists of in a very, very simplified term. It consists of three things, goods, services and money. OK, and the relationship between the goods and services and the money is the thing that dictates the price and the movement of price, i.e. inflation. So what you happens is the economy, the system is never quite in equilibrium or it, it'll pass through equilibrium as it going as it's going through these cycles. But it's like a broke clock is right, right twice a day type of situation. You know what I mean? So it'll pass through equilibrium. But typically it's either moving out of equilibrium or trying to move itself back into equilibrium. And when it goes out of equilibrium is when a bunch of money is dumped into the system. And what do we have in COVID? You had a bunch of money dumped into the system. So then you have that throws it out of equilibrium. We have all this money and your goods and services are relatively fixed because you can't jack up your goods and services. That takes time. So what happens then? Well, when that happens first, that typically is the thing that starts a new era in finance when you have one of those events. But second is that system's now got to move back into equilibrium. And how do you move that system back into equilibrium? Would you just increase the goods and services? No, you can't because they're on fixed schedule. So you got to do something with the money. So you got to get rid of, you got to bring the money back down. So what you need are liquidity destruction events. And what is the best liquidity destruction event you have? A bank failure. You're just killing straight up liquidity. You know the other great one? A stock market crash. You got to suck that liquidity back out of the system to get it back into equilibrium. And that's why like, to go all the way back to the question you asked earlier, you know, or do we expect more failures? Yeah, there's going to be more failures. No question about it. Okay. We don't know when and we don't know which ones. Although, if you read the news and had half a brain, you could get a sense for one of them that's having trouble right now. Okay. Um, you need to destroy that liquidity. So, we are coming, they're coming back down into it. And so, that's that's the thing that we're experiencing right now. We're, just, we're experiencing liquidity destruction events as the market is trying to bring the cash back into the equilibrium with the goods and services. Well, you said stock market. We're seeing some bank stocks tumble, right? You expect more of that? So, uh, yeah. So, like, I expect, <laughs> I expect, um, yeah. There's going to be some. What does Buffett say? You, you never know you're swimming naked till the tide goes out. Well, the tide's gone out, and now uh, anybody who knows what they're talking about knows who's swimming naked, who's been swimming naked. And so, like, uh, you know, I'd be surprised if some of the people who are out there without, without their bathing suit aren't going to get caught. Let's talk about your work yeah. for a minute. Um, you have a Substack. Uh, your clients are bankers, the good ones, right, as you mentioned. You're putting on this symposium in uh, in March. Um, what are you hoping to do? I mean, you have John. You, I mean, you have such great knowledge. I mean, I really appreciate your your work. And like I said earlier, when we started this video, and um, and your understanding of where we are right now. What will you be trying to convey to these bankers in March? So in the thir first 30 minutes of this symposium, um, I'm going to rewrite the model of American banking. It's already been rewritten. I happen upon a, a, a fundamental theoretical flaw in the banking literature that's existed since 1913, which not by coincidence is when the Federal Reserve was founded. And this theoretical flaw 
triggers a number of other things that will change banking in ways that if you take the seminal charts in banking population, profitability, uh, uh, creation, failures, those things, you will actually see a tangible inflection point on the curve as a result of these changes. So I'm going to roll those out. But what those things do is they allow us to understand that what truly has been has driven the financial, what truly has driven the big curves in the banking in the banking charts over the past well, honestly since the beginning of this country and the scholars if there is anybody if there's any group of individual that i would point a finger at that is derelict in their duty it is the scholars it is the scholars and in a variety of different contexts but particularly in this context these people make so much freaking money they're at columbia they're at you know, Wharton, and they make ton, all this money studying. They have all these students to figure all this stuff out. They have all these clients, these bank clients who they consult with, and they make millions of dollars. And it takes a little clown sitting in his office in Portland, Oregon, to find this thing. That's the problem. That's that In my mind, that's a problem. But what I want to do is, and Todd, you and I talked about this earlier, we got one of these lives. That's all we got. Okay. What are we going to do with it? We are just these little beings on a rock that's traveling through space. What is the point of this whole thing? I've come to the conclusion that the point is helping people. And particularly for guys like us, Todd, and you feel the same way. I know that because we talked about this at lunch. We have not only just an, ob an obligation, but we have a duty to help people get better and improve people's lives because you and I have made it. We've made it. You know what I mean? Most people have not. This the per, like this podcast. This is not about me, Todd. This is about you. I want to do my best for you. You know what I mean? Like everything else will work itself out. I appreciate your time. You're the best. Well, there you have it, guys. Do you think that your money's safe in the bank after hearing John speak on the issue? Drop your comments below. I'd love to hear from you. I read them all. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, consider doing so now. Hit that alert bell. You'll know when we upload content just like this. And I have a personal favor to ask. If you think this video has some value, please consider sharing it with your family and friends. It will greatly help the algorithms push this video out so more people see it. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland broker number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.